Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> and thank you for inviting me uh, tonight. And okay. Is this good? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was thinking of uh, you know, uh, remembering Dr. Ali Mazrui, and uh, we wish uh, may Allah shower his soul with uh, his mercy. And, uh, it's a great loss. So, uh, as you have been uh, told, uh, I'm the author of this book, and uh, you know, blurb writers are always um, generous. They inflate things, so they say <laughs> nice things about the authors. So I got uh, one of them there. Uh, I'm going to uh, present a, a little uh, some of the ideas from one of the chapters of the book, and then I'm going to talk generally about other chapters, the kind of uh, an overview of the book. Hopefully, it won't be too boring. I will try to be less uh, academic, uh, uh, more uh, a, a conversation partner. And uh, we would like to move to Q&A session uh, relatively soon. Uh, at any moment, feel free to ask questions. If you have, uh, any questions at any moment, I'll be happy to answer. <coughs> I had some images that I would like to show, so maybe we can start with that. Uh, this book is uh, based on uh, uh, field work in Metro Detroit area. Uh, as you know, uh, Dearborn, Detroit area has a large uh, Muslim uh, concentration in America. And it's a place where Islam has already been uh, well institutionalized and they, it gives a clue about the future of Islam in general to some extent. Uh, so uh, it reflects my observations uh, uh, in the field and uh, I maybe visited more than 50 mosques and uh, uh, came across uh, uh, certain uh, particular aspects that are specifically American and today I want to talk about that, uh, what inspired the title of my book, Finding Mecca in America. Now uh, you see here a Muslim astronaut, guess where he's from, Ermit? <laughs> from Malaysia by the name of um, Zafar uh, Shukur. Uh, so when he went to outer space, a question that uh, Malaysian uh, society dealt with was the question of uh, Qibla. Which way should it turn? Now, interestingly enough, the same issue has come up among Muslim immigrants in America, and it's known as uh, Qibla debate. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into details of uh, the debate yet, but uh, Let's take a look at a few mosques in uh, Metro Detroit area. Most of the mosques in America are uh, in buildings that were not built as mosques. They are converted build buildings. You know, sometimes a bank, uh, uh, as you can see here, a, a <coughs> former church, a synagogue, uh, and a school. In these four pictures, you can see all, all of them. Uh, you might not believe, but there's a bowling alley uh, that has become <laughs> A masjid, and uh, so it's very typical to have uh, mosques that are converted building. Very few mosques were built as mosques, and this were uh, because of uh, significant presence of a certain ethnic group. Um, uh, one of the early uh, figures, early imams um, um, in uh, Metro Detroit area, was uh, Imam Saint Karub, uh, who was the imam of the first mosque in Highland Park. You see the image of it, uh, yeah. and this is the flyer uh, that was kind of uh, inviting people to the opening. And this is his uh, graves. Now, in two mosques in uh, Detroit that are oldest, one is Albanian Islamic Center. Albanian community uh, came as a large chunk of immigrant uh, group, and they started this mosque in 1962. And uh, also Islamic Center of America, it's a Shia mosque. Uh, these two the buildings were built as mosques. You see the minarets and domes and so on. Now, there are two uh, specific uh, attributes of these mosques. They have uh, two mihrabs. Is it? Okay. This is Albanian Islamic Center. It has, there are two qiblas, northeast and southeast. The original one is the one to, towards southeast on the right, and uh, the currently used one is the northeast one. Now this sounds strange. Why did they not remove this? And you know what's the story behind this? When I came across this, uh, 
How many of you know about people are debate in America? I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar since most of my audience here is Muslim. Uh, so usually, you know, I talk about the nature of uh, mosque, how mosque is organized in, uh, in a certain orientation and so on. Now, in the, most of those uh, masjids that we uh, come across, uh, the qibla and the space uh, are not uh, uh, in line with each other. There is a kind of cartographic incongruity. You know, this, this is the building, but we stand this way, right? It's, uh, so a few mosques would, you know, if you are going to build a mosque today, you would have the idea of qibla from the very beginning, uh, facing Mecca, and you will build accordingly. Since buildings are converted, uh, you know, we have this uh, problem, but those build two uh, mosques, they were built as a mosque, and yet their qiblas have changed over time. There's a whole literature about uh, uh, how to face Mecca. Uh, Muslims typically, uh, in, in the old world, so to say, in, in the Middle East, uh, South uh, Asia, in uh, Africa, uh, the direction Muslims turned was more or less uh, settled. It has, was a long, uh, it, it was a totally familiar, taken for granted direction. Uh, for example, in Turkey, people turn towards south. And when they travel to the United States, they continue to turn towards south. I still hear from people who are visiting and, you know, first day and second day, and then later they, are, they discover that uh, it's not south, but it feels like you are really betraying the rule. How come, you know, it's north? Because it's the opposite. Uh, so the debate revolves around the question of uh, whether uh, early Muslim immigrants who came to this country, they used, a, or their imagination was based on a flat map, and it was southeast, you know, east for sure, and it was uh, south. Uh, and uh, it was much later that uh, Muslim experts and scholars uh, uh, reached the conclusion that uh, the direction towards Mecca is not southeast, but northeast. Most of the airplanes are following Qibla <laughs> routes, and uh, so there is still, though, there are, uh, uh, let's say, scholarly disagreements on the nature of, you know, uh, uh, determination, determination of the Qibla, and therefore it is not absolutely the result, I would say. Nevertheless, there is a, a consensus on the part of Muslim community in this country that Northeast is the Qibla. So once people discovered this uh, uh, fact. Uh, then they had to change the uh, qibla in the masjid. So mihrab, that's the niche in the wall, as you saw in the earlier picture, instead of destroying it or removing it, they simply place a prior rug and the congregation start to have a different orientation. So the, uh, you know, the lines of the rugs and so on kind of give people a certain orientation. This is Kaaba, the source of Muslim orientation, the uh, the beginning, the origin, that uh, kind of shapes like a, uh, a concentric uh, circles, it extends and covers the whole uh, globe, and that's how uh, Qibla is formed. Uh, this is, uh, you know, from theoretical point of view, it's uh, uh, interesting because Qibla is an opaque building. You can't see it uh, from outside, but it's that opaqueness creates the outer space. It, cre it punctuates the uh, space for Muslim is an oriented space. It formats it, uh, so to say. This, uh, of course, is not uh, uh, limited to Kaaba. Uh, you know, temples in the past and you know, in various uh, cultures and religions had this wording uh, effect, meaning they turn, they, by punctuating, it makes that thing visible. It creates a space. Imagine that there is a, a glass wall and there is no, no marker on it and you don't even notice it. Uh, you might bump into it, you might hurt yourself, right? But if someone had put some sticker on it or some sign, and that brings out the glass, existence of glass. So that's the function of uh, Kaaba. Basically, it cr uh, gives rise to the space as, a, as Qibla. All right. Now, one of the most interesting things about Kaaba is that from outside of Kaaba, you have to turn towards Kaaba. Right? But what if you are inside the Kaaba? Which way should you turn? Anybody who had that uh, chance? 
Anybody has been to Inside <laughs> It's a privilege only few people probably have, uh, right? Uh, to get inside. But if you were to pray inside Kaaba, which way would you turn? Just, uh, just talk to somebody who had been there, and they were told they can pray anywhere. Anyway, anyway. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Yunus has uh, talked to someone who had been uh, inside uh, Kaaba, and that's a place where you can turn in any direction. Very interesting, right? Any direction is correct, but outside of Kaaba, you have to turn towards the Kaaba. It's, it's not since the Kaaba itself. There is no direction then. No Every direction is right. Exactly. Now, uh, from America, Muslims who came to this country, uh, we know from slave narratives that some early Muslims, Muslim slaves, they turned towards east. There was a generic direction of you know sacred land. It was Jerusalem, you know Mecca, and the old world, and so on. And. Uh, most of you know uh, immigrants. They later on, of course, they turn towards southeast. Nation of Islam for a long time they turn towards, in Detroit at least, they turn towards west, to Chicago, towards their headquarters. So within America we have a situation that is uh, uh, similar to inside Kaaba, uh, that is anomic, meaning it it hasn't been really formatted yet. People haven't have, have not yet discovered the right direction. So there is this chaos of directions. And, uh, and so the challenge that Muslims have experienced is how do we link Mecca and America? How do we extend this orientedness that is Qibla uh, into America and clear basically, uh, clear America into uh, correct uh, Qibla? Uh, so there is this kind of digestion of this new world, incorporation of this new world into this uh, oriented space that we call uh, Qibla, Muslim space. So the question is, you know, how do we make America uh, Islamic by extending Qibla into it? So this kind of uh, gives the uh, idea of uh, uh, an illustration of this uh, parallelism between America and uh, Kaaba. This is some uh, academic mumbo jumbo, so just uh, think of it. There is a famous uh, philosopher, uh, uh, historian, Michel Foucault, who had studied uh, Panopticon. And it's about the prison, modern prison, how in modern society uh, surveillance has been uh, centered in a tower and you know there are cells around it. So he talks about discipline and so on. And so I took it as a, uh, as a uh, useful uh, uh, way of uh, thinking about Kaaba as an uh, instrument of spiritual discipline, as something that formats spirits. It's not a, it's, it, it's equally spatial, but it's not a closed space. It's a, it's, it opens up the space. So for academics, this is an interesting comparison, but uh, if you're not academic, it may not be uh, that useful. Now, uh, we I, I mentioned the Nation of Islam uh, community in the uh, Detroit area that they for a long time they turned towards uh, uh, Chicago and their practices were mostly a combination of Christianity and Islam. It was uh, very much you know, deeply racial. It had more to do with the restoration of uh, uh, the dignity of black people than uh, Islam per se. Uh, it was Islam to the extent that Islam was available to the community. So, Sometimes immigrant uh, uh, Muslims in this country, you know, fail to uh, uh, pay uh, due respect to that uh, history. I don't want to, of course, uh, you know, imply any disrespect. But it had this uh, kind of hybrid uh, nature uh, as a as a, an articulation of Islam in America. And gradually, a nation of Islam, as you know, went through uh, transitions. Uh, under the leadership of Warifin Muhammad, and it became uh, orthodox. Now, here, uh, this is uh, Imam Salim Rahman uh, from Masjid Wali Muhammad, and he says this place used to be Muhammad Temple Number One in 1975. That's when Imam Warifin Muhammad takes the leadership of the movement. He changed it into Masjid Wali Muhammad. All we did, we took out chairs and brought in carpets and changed the direction from west to Qibla. 
And so you see the adjustment, gradual kind of uh, 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 convergence of uh, immigrant and uh, indigenous Muslims in this country. Uh, this is Imam Abdullah El Amin uh, from uh, Detroit, the, one, the, the bank mosque. This one uh, is the Imam at the masjid, and he says. You know, it's almost like when the Prophet changed the direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca. So on Limud over there, they used to pray to the west, but Imam Muhammad said, no, the direction is to Mecca. So instantly, the whole community turned to face Mecca. It was a very powerful event. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Masjid al-Qiblatayn, a masjid with two Qiblas, and that's where the decision to shift uh, Qibla from uh, uh, Jerusalem to Mecca uh, took place. And as such, it has two Qiblas. Now, in the beginning of Islam, in the origin of Islam, you find this bifurcated Qibla, this the decision is made. Uh, and then, in, in the rest of the Muslim world, there is only one Qibla because it has been formatted and it has sedimented and it has become part of common sense. On the frontiers of Islam, in places where Islam totally new, it's like a, a, a new land, a, a terra incognita, you are you know, you are going to give it a name, give it a direction, and build a house, and so on. In such places, again, we see resurfacing of this Qiblatain situation. And that was uh, what I observed in the two uh, mosques uh, in Detroit area. Of course, over time, uh, both of these mosques now, they have moved, since I did my research there, into new places. And those traces will be lost. Uh, but it is part of Muslim uh, settlement in America. And this settlement process is a, question, is a matter of inhabitation. Uh, when you move to a new uh, place, a new apartment or a house, you first, uh, it's, it appears foreign to you. You start to see problems and things that need to be fixed and so on. It's not yours, it's other people's dirt appears to you and so on. Once you decide to move in and you, you really move in, then you start to cover things and clean and so on. And it becomes your space. You start to appropriate it. And you don't see it as bothering anymore. Unless it's really bothering you, anyway, that might happen. But uh, this happens with our clothes, when we purchase clothes, right? First, it's an object. We are very critical and questioning. Once it is yours, you, you know, it's perfect. You forget about it. Here is uh, the kind of uh, transitions that uh, the nation of Islam had experienced in terms of naming. Uh, the movement was called the lost and found nation of Islam in the wilderness of North America. So black people uh, were not uh, strangers to America, uh, but slavery and oppression and uh, kind of uh, the civil death that uh, slavery inflicted on African uh, 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 citizens of America uh, made uh, alienated them from American mainstream culture, and therefore they sought a kind of a root, uh, uh, a, a authenticity in Islam as a uh, original civilization of uh, uh, African people. And so America was a place where uh, black people were lost, and they were regaining their identity and their authenticity through Islam. So Nation of Islam more or less uh, represented this, and as you know, they were called black Muslims, and Islam was a black religion uh, for them. Uh, but with uh, Malcolm X and later uh, Imam Warithi Muhammad, uh, the movement becomes uh, more uh, orthodox and uh, it starts to call its world community of all Islam in the West, then American Muslim Mission, then the Minister of W.D. Muhammad, Muslim American Society, and so on and so forth. In each instance of renaming, we see a transition, a kind of uh, convergence with the, uh, with the immigrant uh, culture. So uh, what, of course, this convergence produces is not uh, necessarily uh, a certain version of immigrant Islam. It, it becomes American Islam, because both sides adjust themselves. Now, uh, as you can see, this story of finding Qibla uh, was an interesting uh, experience, part of uh, history of Islam in America. But also it's a useful metaphor to think about uh, the venture of Islam in America. Uh, how do Muslims appropriate American space in terms of direction, but also, for example, in terms of culture? English language. 
how Islamic is English language. God bless him, uh, Imam, uh, uh, Dr. Ismail Raji al Faruqi, one of the founders of Triple IT, if not the founder. Uh, he wrote a booklet, probably few people remember it now. It's called uh, Islamic uh, English. Towards Islamic. Towards Islamic English. And in it, he has. Uh, uh, He's battling with English language and with the questions of how can we make Islam, uh, English language compatible with Islam. Because English language as it is, is not capable of expressing Islamic uh, uh, ideas, concepts and so on. And we need to make certain modifications, we need to ban language and so on. It's a very interesting, uh, the language is an external object that needs to be treated and cleansed and uh, purified so that it fits uh, Muslim uh, uh, needs. Now, take this as an instance of Muslim encounter with, with English language. And today, ask you know American-born English-speaking uh, Muslim uh, youth, uh, uh, tell them you know is English compatible with Islam? They're gonna laugh. It sounds you know of course it is compatible. We are already living it, and so on. and so this uh, is one of the uh, aspects of uh, this inhabitation, appropriation of uh, American culture as a Muslim culture. Uh, that uh, a new Islam is being uh, reproduced within English language uh, and it's completely natural. In the past, attitudes were shaped by reactions towards missionaries, uh, reactions towards uh, uh, colonial power, so English belonged to some external uh, uh, identity. It was associated with Christianity and, uh, uh, and uh, anti-Islamic uh, uh, cultures. Uh, today, we, we, we Muslims have transcended this and it's totally forgotten. Uh, that's also part of uh, uh, our kind of subconscious and past uh, and so on. Uh, am I doing okay time-wise? Feel you free to interview you anytime don't you fine. want and feel free to ask questions so we are uh, totally I'll, I'll, relaxed. I'll stop you when I, All right, when I feel like, yeah. All right. Now, uh, Muslim immigrants, when they first uh, arrived in America, they were thinking, you know what, we are in the land of Kufar. It's a terrible culture. It's a dirty culture, impure. And all, what, what, why are we here, especially the student ones? Uh, now their parents and grandparents. They said, well, we need the technology and science and knowledge. We should acquire those uh, uh, elements from American culture, but avoid any uh, other aspects, the cultural and religious and so on. And so Muslims were, uh, uh, especially uh, Muslims who shaped uh, Muslim American institutions in this country, uh, they had an attitude of uh, skepticism, to say the least, towards uh, 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 American uh, culture. So America was considered a, a well, if we are to employ a juridical distinction that we find in the medieval Islamic language, it's Darul Harb, Darul Islam. So America was Darul Harb, the land of chaos, uh, uh, land of uh, war, uh, although it's a little misleading, meaning it's the place where uh, Muslims are not supposed to live. If they leave, only it should be because they need to leave. There should be some justification. The justification discovered in this country was Dawa. So suddenly a concept that's not so central to other Muslims in the rest of the world became a key concept for American Muslims. So we are here for Dawah and suddenly Darul Harb or Darul Kurb, uh, uh, Darul Kuf became Darul Dawah. It becomes an open space, it's a frontier that can be explored and resources can be extracted uh, and uh, we can spread Islam, that's why we are here. If you are not trying to spread Islam in America, uh, then uh, you shouldn't be here. That was the uh, uh, attitude for uh, some uh, time. And once people start to interact with the environment, and they engage in Dawa and so on, they recognize, they start to see some good elements in this foreign entity. So you start to see, well, you know, not all Americans are bad, you know. Okay, not every action and every aspect of the, you know, character of non-Muslims is anti-Islamic. People can be maybe more Muslim than Muslims in certain areas. So you start to see positive things uh, in uh, American culture, and you start start to be critical of certain aspects of Muslim culture, back home especially, things like authoritarianism, you know, or, uh, oppression and so on. 
So from Dar al Dawa, gradually Muslims arrive at their first kind of negotiation with American citizenship in the form of Dar al Ahd, the land of uh, agreement, a kind of social contract, idea of social contract. Basically, we live in this society. America uh, allows us to live according to our uh, faith, and we practice Islam freely. And we should we respect American law, but you know we don't want to mingle too much. We don't want to be uh, uh, we don't want to assimilate, but we recognize this kind of contractual coexistence. And there is enough justification you can find from Islamic tradition and jurisprudence to produce such a. Uh, uh, such a uh, framework for Muslims to live in. Once mm -hmm. Muslims have this kind of relative peace and coexistence with American culture, over time uh, we see a transition towards the discovery that, you know what, American constitution is actually the most Islamic constitution on earth. And it is true, I, I personally agree. <laughs> uh, and uh, people start to see in American values uh, Islamic uh, elements. It's, uh, it's, this is not at the level of words, of course, because now the American Muslims are capable of penetrating into ideas and recognizing society for uh, whatever it is. And so gradually, America shifts from being uh, Darul Ahd to being Darul Islam, the land of peace. America is more Islamic than Saudi Arabia, uh, or America is more Islamic than Iran. Uh, America is more Islamic than Turkey, especially when hijab was not allowed in Turkey for many years and so on. So, uh, this kind of uh, transitions uh, made America a legitimate, Islamically legitimated homeland for Muslims. And uh, so, uh, that's the kind of uh, 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 transitions that I cover in the book as uh, how Muslims cross those boundaries that <coughs> made uh, American elements of American culture and f as f foreign objects, then they become part of Muslims. And so Muslims now see, look at the world as American Muslim rather than as Muslims in America. When you look at the names Muslim institutions use in this country, you will notice that the early names were all like Muslims in America. Islamic society of uh, North America. It's very wide land, right? And Muslims are planted on it. and and uh, then it becomes American Muslim society, look at care, that uh, uh, hyphen, American Islamic, you know, it's connecting it. And then that hyphen uh, disappears. Then so American in Islam and American Muslim becomes integral parts over time. So all those transitions are part of how uh, Islam uh, has been made in uh, American religion. Also, it's not convention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In it's not convention. <laughs> if we look at the titles over years, in the last 13 years of it's not convention. If I can uh, find it, it's not in. Okay. <laughs> can, well, maybe he didn't memorize it, but uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I put it in my uh, book. book where uh, uh, it's first, it's, uh, you know, how to preserve our identity in this adversarial environment and then you know neighborly friends and, and then the, then Islam disappears <laughs> it becomes like American civil religion language of peace and you know social services solidarity rising Which is generation totally there is no reference to Islam so instead of all those warfare you know Muslim in foreign land you know with their arms up and trying to protect their identity now we, we are have questions of you know raising our children family issues helping poor people so basically we became part of uh, this society as Muslims, and a certain degree of comfort uh, sense in this uh, sense of foreignness, uh, alienation is eliminated. Uh, and this is a normal thing, that's what we experience in everything foreign. We, we have this sense of digesting mentally and habitually, digesting our environment. Uh, the book is mostly about this. I also talk about, do I have time a little bit? Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, I talk about uh, care, for example, the story of Constellone American Islamic relations. Uh, and here we see Muslim uh, immigrants who find themselves in this new environment. They do not know their rights yet, because, for example, they are from Syria and they live under some dictator, right? And here they are kind of reluctant to be politically active and so on. So we see institutions like care. Uh, educating and uh, provoking Muslims towards becoming active citizens, telling them what their rights are. So right bearers, 
who are not bearing rights yet, Muslims. And their rights are kind of meeting each other through the work of such institutions like CARE. All the crises like 9-11 and so on, uh, they force Muslims to embrace American uh, civil rights language. Muslims are, you know, they all know that there is a Japanese internment. <laughs> they all know, you know, civil rights movement and so on. Uh, and they even visit, uh, the, uh, you know, Japanese American community. And so there is exchange and solidarity. Sikh American community getting support and uh, know-how from a Muslim American community. Uh, so there I study how uh, uh, disciplining of uh, Muslim uh, subjects as uh, right-bearing subjects happens over time through crisis. So to make it simple, uh, disasters like 9-11, they have uh, resulted in you know, a lot of hardship for Muslims, but at the same time, it encouraged them to be active citizens. It actually accelerated integration of Muslims to American society. So that's one of the kind of uh, counterintuitive uh, argument I kind of uh, come up with. Um, when you look at interfaith dialogue activities, uh, Muslims discover, guess whom? Abraham, Prophet Abraham. While Abraham is just one among many prophets, of course he's important, but uh, he's not that important in the rest of the Muslim world. But in America, in Western context, he is the common ground. So we see this Abrahamic language coming to the fore as Muslims engage in dialogue uh, a little out of uh, panic, a uh, fear of uh, exclusion and discrimination. But also, all it is true, Abraham is the father of uh, right uh, three monotheistic religions. And so uh, this dialogue and uh, uh, interaction with Christians and Jews uh, in American society, which is part of being proper citizens in this country, encourages Muslims to uh, to have a strong emphasis on uh, Abraham, Prophet Abraham. And so Muslims have entered American civil uh, religion, what scholars call civil religion, uh, and uh, have adopted uh, the language of faith. So instead of saying Islam religion, and in the Isna titles you see that Islam becomes from religion, it moves, first it is a civilization, oppositional civilization, and then it becomes a religion, okay, we are separate, don't come close to me, and then it becomes a faith, we are all, you know, everybody has a faith, and we live uh, harmoniously together. Finally, uh, with 9-11, uh, we, we saw the rise of Muslim <laughs> ethnic comedy, and I devote a chapter, the kind of uh, last chapter of the book, to uh, the rise of Muslim ethnic comedy, and uh, of course, there are always, you know, all immigrant communities, they have some uh, funny folks and funny incidents, uh, enough reason to laugh. Uh, but for the first time, we see a robust uh, Muslim American comedy emerge, rather than, let's say, Pakistan American or Egyptian American uh, immigrant uh, experiences giving rise to uh, humor. And uh, humor is something that uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, abundantly found in immigrant uh, generations, uh, sorry, immigrant countries, because when you have two worlds, two separate worlds, they, there is friction between them. There are two perspectives about the world, and you know, something that's normal in one would sound funny in the other. So you can think of it in uh, you know, certain words that are normal in one language, in another language that are dangerous, and so on. So no wonder all uh, comedians in American society and immigrant society are mostly immigrants. You know, they were Jews and black people and Puerto Ricans and you know now Muslims are on the scene. And uh, earlier generations have disappeared. Those whose uh, minority status cannot be eliminated, those who cannot melt into whiteness, they remain. So uh, you know African American humor uh, is persistent in this society. Whiteness have become a minority in terms of you know redneck. Uh, humor and so on. So we see Muslim comedians emerging and they use uh, their uh, the stage like an airport because airport is the place where Muslim shows up to American public. It's the place where it says, you know, please report any suspicious person <laughs> activity. That means, you know, any Muslim if you see and all the Muslims are in panic. I hope they don't see me or they don't report me. Uh, you know, one uh, comedian, Azar Usman, says that, you know, he, he says, after hearing such a uh, uh, such an announcement, he calls the security people. He say, they come and they say, "Where is he?" Well, I said, "Sir, I saw him right here. Where?" He says, "Right there." 
and says, sir, this is mirror. <laughs> You're looking at yourself. And, you know, it's, of course, you know, you should hear jokes from the comedians, not uh, academics. <laughs> we destroy their uh, funniness. Uh, but it's, uh, there is a deep, uh, actually, uh, uh, psychoanalytical element in that, uh, that uh, you know, you start to see yourself as the other, as the source of danger, despite all your efforts, and so on. Uh, and so at the airport, you cannot uh, make jokes. It's illegal. You, you are going to go to jail, and there's a you know British student, female student, who makes a joke. Say, oh, what's in this? They ask. Says, oh, there's a bomb. In it. <laughs> well, they take her to uh, away, and then she she goes to jail because it's uh, illegal to make jokes. And now Muslim comedians have turned their stage into a symbolic airport. So they enter the stage, uh, passing through the security check, and so on. Because that has become the window through which Muslims can speak to American people. Because that's how Islam entered the American imagination, through security, terrorism, and aviation. How do you humanize is Islam and Muslims? Well, that's your only opportunity, so to say, your window of opportunity. And you speak through that language and show that, well, you know, the, what you thought to be terrorist is actually a normal person like you. And that's the, you know, the most... Uh, primordial joke of Picabo, you know, you hide and you show and so on. So I have, you know, a lot of analysis of uh, Muslim ethnic comedy that uh, uh, helps us understand how Islam settled in this uh, society and is continuing to settle. So briefly speaking about my next project, it's called Frontiers of American Islam. And it has to do with the fields that are specifically American. Uh, and the Muslim presence in such fields. How do Muslims understand and digest such fields? For example, chaplaincy. You don't have that institution outside of America. In the Muslim world, you don't have such an institution. It's a specific American institution. So Muslim chaplain, how do they define themselves? Uh, their experiences and so on. They have to adopt a certain language. Uh, similarly, Muslim politicians, people like uh, Keith Allison and uh, Andre Carson, and uh, I live in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, my college is in Manhattan, the town Manhattan, but I live in Teaneck. And our mayor is a uh, Bangladeshi Muslim. Uh, and uh, one of his uh, chief uh, voters, I mean, the, one of the block voters for him are Jewish Americans, Orthodox Jews, because he's local of uh, Teaneck, and so there, you know, there are various communities. And so there is a kind of consensus, and he was real elected, and you know people, everybody's happy with that. So this is also an unexpected story in many ways. So <coughs> Muslim politicians in American society, frontier figures, uh, their experiences uh, is what I'm interested in. Uh, halal, halal food vendors, for example, there was a protest against so-called Ground Zero Mosque a couple of years ago in Manhattan. And, uh, and guess what? You know they say you know Sharia is barbers and all that, and right there it's halal food vendor, and they, they buy uh, food. <laughs> they buy food so you see Sharia on the streets of New York in a totally naturalized form. You know the halal food vendors, it, it's absolutely part of the urban texture of New York. Uh, so I'm kind of interested in those uh, experiences of uh, Muslim presence and how American uh, context and Muslim identity are kind of. Uh, being negotiated and uh, decided upon. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you.